Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I am so excited to hear from Daniel Dutton and Sawako Nakayasu. My name is Laura Henriksen. I am the Director of Learning and Community Engagement at the Poetry Project. Before we get started, I just have a few announcements and reminders that I wanted to share with everybody. Um, I suspect that many people here are perhaps uh, even more familiar with Zoom than they would prefer to be. Um, but just as a reminder, uh, we are recording tonight's event, so it's entirely your preference if you'd like to have your camera on or off, um, but just something to keep in mind. And also, uh, your, it's possible to change your name um, as it appears if you click on your own individual little box, the um, ellipses in there has the rename option for you. Um, I also wanted to note, you'll see up at the top in the left hand corner, this live on custom live streaming service. Um, if you select that uh, and then click start, uh, does it say? View stream on custom streaming service that will open up a transcript of tonight's event in a browser window so you could follow along that, that way that's available to you. Um, one of our amazing moderators for tonight's event, Corey Hutchinson, is now going to add into the chat um, uh, a PDF that we made that just is some sort of best practices for Zoom. Um, Thank you so much, Corey. I also want to note that Corey has some really, really amazing poems up uh, in Wax9 that everyone should check out after tonight's event. I highly recommend. Um, great. And if you have any questions throughout the course of the reading, if any problems with Zoom, feel free to chat Corey. He'll be happy to help you. Um, Corey is now also adding into the chat another PDF link um, to our statement of safer spaces. Um, that statement is also available at the bottom of the previous PDF because it is super important. Um, the Poetry Project's commitment to safer spaces is, uh, remains unchained even as we are gathering virtually um, rather than in physical space. Um, if it is changed, it's really only insofar as it is an ongoing and deepening practice. And we're really grateful to you all for joining us in this work um, and in this commitment. I feel like with virtual programming, there's stuff about it that I really, really love. Like, I think it's really amazing that it's possible for us to gather across distance, as we've already seen in the chat. People are joining us from all over the country and the world, including my mom, who's tuning in from California tonight. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. Um, so I think that's really incredible. And I also appreciate that even as the, like the Poetry Project has always been committed to never turning anyone away for an inability to pay the cover for our events. But now that's even less of an issue because all of our events are free. Um, it feels, it's a great, uh, it's our great fortune to be able to offer this programming. Um, and with this commitment to making poetry accessible to as many people as possible, we also remain deeply committed to materially supporting all of the poets um, and event staff and teachers and everyone who comes through the Poetry Project. Um, so if it is possible for you tonight to support the Poetry Project in that work, we are really humbled and honored um, by that generosity. And if it is not possible for you tonight, we are humbled and honored that you've chosen to spend your Friday evening with us, but Corey is putting in the chat now a link to donate to the Poetry Project. Um, under other circumstances, we would right now be gathered in St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, uh, which is the church that was built over the site where Peter Stuyvesant built his family chapel in 1660. Peter Stuyvesant enslaved 40 people and in his time as director general of New Netherlands increased the population of enslaved people in the colony um, using their stolen lives and labor to construct the buildings and roads on the stolen land. Um, one such construction project was actually a wall um, all the way from the East River to the Hudson uh, built by enslaved people um, with the intent, the purpose of 
further displacing the Lenape people whose land it was stolen. Um, the Poetry Project in St. Mark's Church is located on the unceded homeland of the Lenape people, um, Lenape Hoking. I am speaking to you tonight from Sunset Park in Brooklyn, the unceded homeland of the Canarsie people, a Muncie-speaking band of Lenape people. This neighborhood's waterfront was redlined in the 1930s. Um, that same waterfront is now where Municipal Det Detention Center is located, a federal prison that currently is incarcerating 1,600 people. Corey is now also adding to the chat a map, not to endorse it as complete, but to invite us all to continually learn about the land that we occupy, its history, and its ties. As we gather together across these various neighborhoods and states and nations, um, it gives me an opportunity to remember that it's not, the, it's not just that some of the land is stolen and so some of the land needs to be returned, but that all of it is. And it also gives me opportunity to remember that when we think about land back, it's not sort of a, a matter of a capitalist transfer of ownership, but as many indigenous scholars and thinkers have helped us to understand is, is in fact about, among other things, rethinking ownership and belonging in really radical ways, um, centering indigenous autonomy and relationality and responsibility. Uh, to reiterate, Gloria Anzaldúa, who is speaking about what is called Texas, um, as I'm speaking about what is called New York, this land was Lenape Hoking always and is and will be again. For tonight's event, um, first I'm going to introduce Danielle Dutton, who will read. We'll take a really quick break um, and then regather, and I will introduce Sawako, and then we'll hear from her. Um, thank you again for being here. Reading Dutton and Nakayasu's work together this week, both of which explore, among many other things, the incredible, inexhaustible vastness of women and girls. I was reminded of a line Meme Bersenbrugger writes in her book, Four-Year-Old Girl, quote, you, are, you place 16 girls in a meadow and always fill it, end quote. There is in this work a cacophonous abundance without surplus. There is room enough in these worlds of the body, of the suburb, of the party, of the country for everything. In Daniel Dutton's sprawl, there are lists. Lists of food, of trash, of furniture, of words spoken followed by other words. Dutton writes, that's the quality of one moment. It consists of cruelty, breakfast plates, indecision, a moth-eaten sweater, trees, and tulips. Tremendously, excitedly, perversely bored, end quote. These assemblages, units of things and units of time, neither flatten precisely nor swirl. They seem to hold all energy, both potential and kinetic, simultaneously, both ongoing and somehow already elsewhere. Everything is relational, even as their relationships remain occulted, obscure, vaguely or overtly sexual. Quote, these small boxes glint in the half light as I place them in specific patterns, as markers of my own personal history, or like a new museum, end quote. The days in the town at the heart of sprawl move with uncanny temporality. One night is two nights, is 15 years, is a thousand. The history that makes the suburbs possible, settler colonialism, banks and lending, organized abandonment, the regulation of gender and sex and space is everywhere. Not like a haunting, but like a neighbor whose eyes you meet walking the dog around the cul-de-sac, grilling on their lawn, Dutton writes, and this quote's a little longer, but it's just so important. I migrate over sidewalks and lawns. Then I supply sexually constipated and hypocritical citizens with all kinds of bonuses and obligatory rituals. For example, there's the fact that the most important part of me will never even be seen. I can say about it, this is my own primary interest, or I'd rather be a goose in Canada. This is what it means to be a national grown-up. 
It's a kind of supportive and spontaneous process involving naive, imitative, prudish culture. Its critics and creators seem to just go on living, end quote. As ongoing as letters or ev evidence of former lovers, as opaque as feelings, as fraudulent as history, the effort of living is both hidden and the only thing there is in all the things there are. I'm so excited to hear now from Daniel Dutton. Yay, I'm unmuted now, thank you. Um, thank you for that lovely introduction, Laura, um, and for inviting me to read tonight. I'm really delighted to be here um, and to be reading with Sawako, whose work I've admired and enjoyed for many years now, since I first saw some of her ants crawling across a page. Um, I just looked at the gallery view and um, I feel like I might cry because I see a bunch of friends and my mother-in-law is here and it's just making me realize how long it's been since I've seen any of you. Um, and I love you guys. Um, I'm going to actually read some, I'm going to catch my breath. I'm going to read some newer stuff to start. Um, let me turn on my timer. This is a piece that's called Nocturne. From the back seat, her son explains what would happen if she got sucked into a black hole. Moon-faced flowers are wild sweet potato with heart-shaped leaves and hairy seeds, white and alive in the night. It's a perfect example of exponential growth, he says. In summer, the light stays long. Cicadas apocalyptic with the windows rolled down. Fast down the hill toward the Ohio heading home. On the opposite bank, an oil refinery spreads into Kentucky, its tall stacks shooting flames into the sky. Imagine your body being split in two halves, he says. West Virginia is wild. It's right there on the signs. Montani Semper Liberi. Montani Semper Liberi means mountains are always free. Then imagine both halves of your body being split in half, and those halves being split in half, then those halves being split in half, and then those halves being split in half. So you just keep splitting your pieces until you were only molecules. You were only molecules, she thinks. And those sweet potato flowers, like a million wagging moons. Mom, he says, are you listening? In a story she read last week at the beach, a man in a straw hat cut off a duck's head while the children stood and watched. Lid, 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 the man called. Qua, 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 said the duck. Then the head fell to the grass, and the duck's feet ran its bottom half away. Yes, she tells him. Yes, she shouts over the wind. It's the hottest week in the world. In Sweden, a forest fire has crossed the Arctic Circle. In Oman, the overnight low is 120 degrees. Near a small German town famous for its asparagus, Long deserted bombs are exploding beneath the trees. And just downstream in Czechia, a hunger stone has emerged in the Elbe, the water having hit a record low. If you see me, weep, it reads. The words etched desperately four centuries before. A second message emerges upriver. We cried, we cry, and you will cry. But the dead are loud as toasters. The fish flash in the mud. Meanwhile, further north, seen only from the sky, ghostly landscapes rise up via drought. The blueprint of an 18th century mansion on a lawn, a World War II airfield beneath a Hampshire farm, an elaborate Victorian garden long ago cut down. Looking at the drone shot of that non-house on her phone, she thought of pressed flowers gone brown. No, those cyanotypes of seaweed she saw once on display. A woman named Anna Atkins laid carefully dried specimens on chemically treated paper. Left out in the sun, the seaweed burned its own pale shadow onto a deep blue page. The smell of Kentucky is flammable, damp, the refinery like a spaceship. This blue drama, that exhibition was called. 
1672, her son informs her, Robert Boyle read an entire magazine by the light coming off a piece of rotting veal. From Delaware to Kentucky, they've counted 15 dead deer by the side of the road. Once the sun set, the deer began to glow. It was a neck, he says. It was this disgusting fatty piece of baby cow neck. At a, cement, at a cement table by a grassy field, they eat warm melon and pretzels and hard boiled eggs. A red winged blackbird trills on a stalk. An old man in the darkened lot moves toward them like a glacier. I love summer, her son says, oblivious to the stranger, listening to cicadas ringing on and on. We should just keep driving to wherever it's summer, and when it's not summer there, we should drive to wherever it's summer next. The air is thick with meadow grass and bugs. On the one hand, on the highway, traffic rushes past, but pale moths twist over the field as if there were no time. A part of her whirls outward with those moths, out and out to native plants as weedy as her kid, a crooked stem aster, a blazing star. When she was small, smaller than he is now, and quiet, much quieter than him, her mother wallpapered their apartment in a stylized jungle print. The leaves on the banana trees curled away like ribs. The eyes of the jungle cats looked out like human eyes. Every night when the lights clicked off, she saw men stepping between the leaves and right off of the walls. At last, the stranger has arrived. Hello, she says. Her son turns. The old man opens a toothless mouth. He is trying to tell them something and they are trying to hear it, but it takes him 30 years to get it out. I know, she says, when he is done. He turns his gaze to the clamorous field. No, he shakes his head. You've got a long way to go. Night comes to Kentucky with red clouds and green sky, and then the fields are flat. No breeze blows. Some satellites shine. With the old man asleep in the seat beside her and her son asleep in the back, she is the only one to see the electric billboard in the middle of nowhere that says, Jesus recycled humans. The road rises up. Two weeks at her mother's house has emptied her all the way out. Oh, house in Delaware, bought by a dead husband. Oh, house, a vast expanse of white. That first morning, she stepped into the yard and everything was wrong. Pool, umbrella, plastic shark, as if she'd never been there. On the rocks, her mother hissed before even brewing coffee. Several minutes ticked away as she waited for panic to pass, but the sun was clearly rising on the wrong side of that yard, or else she'd woken back to front, and this was what it was like to face the ass side of your mind. The road rising steeply, the trees nearer the road, the moon like a beacon now between sweet gum and ash and pine. In Pennsylvania, there's a house made of glass where you can stand in one spot and watch the sunset and the moon rise at the exact same time. How comforting it sounds, up on a hill surrounded by woods invisible from the road. Who'd want to live in an invisible house, rings her mother's voice in her mind. A neon something flashes past. She remembers a half forgotten class about the beginning of everything back before the bang. A whole semester of lectures on the origin of the world. A yawning gap there was to start in regions of fire and frost and salt, but nowhere grass. In every direction, the fields run gray as if the night absorbed their green. But once upon a time, all matter and light were one then the stars, and then the fireflies, and then the grass. She has no idea of the time. The clock on the dashboard tells her it's tomorrow. She searches out her phone on the floor, but the car swerves, surprising her, and the old man stirs in his sleep. For hours, the road just goes. Traffic has thinned, and her mind makes little visits to that story she read at the beach. Oh, but I do want to be a bee frightfully, said the girl called Kitsia, who sometimes dreamed of camels. But she wasn't allowed to be a bee. She had to pick something else if she wanted to play the game. A rooster, a bull, a donkey, a sheep. Then when she raised her eyes from the book, it was as if the story had dreamed the bees. Tiny golden bees were hovering above the sand, and the waves were going wild, since somewhere out there a tropical storm was turning and headed in. 
so they fled her mother's house, days of endless rain, fast through West Virginia and Kentucky heading home. It's the hottest week in the world. In Siberia, the permafrost is collapsing into holes. In California, the tide at night blooms an eerie blue. A wildfire in Texas caused a storm with one inch hail. Then a billboard warns her, hell is real. And like a joke, the road descends to another refinery and its pipe stacks shooting flames into the sky. All is passing memory, she thinks. In the largest of those Siberian holes, what scientists term a mega slump, they've discovered an ancient forest and plants untouched by the light of the sun for 45,000 years. The locals are afraid. They call the slump a door and claim it makes sounds in the dark. Their hands are cracked and shaking. Who wants to crawl inside? When they walk over the tundra, the ground beneath their boots turns to jelly with every step. First it's one hole and then another. And then at the bottom of the deepest, they find a frozen lake. The ice is black and solid, but someone sees something inside, down inside that lake. He gets on his hands and knees, brushes away the snow. Look, she says, she can't help herself. Sparks from the refinery are drifting through the night sky like luminescent plankton. The old man's toothless mouth expels cool air and bats. Where are we, cries a voice in the car. The road begins to turn. They are driving upside down on the bottom of the planet. She wish wishes she could tell him the truth. She says, we're almost home. So that was that piece, Nocturne. Um, and let's see. Um, I actually meant to say this right before, but um, Laura mentioned Mamie Bersenbrugge, and that was, um, was, she's one of my favorite poets, and that story that I just read was um, really influenced by um, Hello, the Roses. So now I'm going to read something um, I thought. I'm not really a poet. Um, as you might have noticed, but um, this is a story all about poets. Um, and it's dedicated to a poet I know named Jenny Cronovit. Um, and it's called um, Lost Lunar Apogee. Let me just see. Okay. At dinner, a poet visiting from China said he planned the following day to try to get inside T.S. Eliot's childhood home. Someone else at the table, another man from China, but who'd lived in St. Louis for years, told a story about being shown into the very house when he and his wife had been looking to buy. He hadn't realized where he was until he was inside it. He saw stairs for the family and stairs for the servants. They wanted everything separate, he said. I knew only one person at the table. Like most of the others, she was a poet. It was cold in the cellar of the restaurant where we'd all met to celebrate the Chinese poet's visit and out three small square windows high up in the whitewashed wall were plants shaped like coral but bright green. It must have been a lot of work, the second man suddenly said into a bit of silence. I nodded with the others, though I had no idea what he meant. Then the waiter set down my wine. Lunar apogee, he announced. What a dippy name for a wine, I thought, At the, as the woman to my right said it was the perfect title for a first book of poems destined to win awards. Was it the wine then that got us talking about Mina Loy? Moreover, she wrote The Moon and not T.S. Eliot's Boyhood Home. My friend claimed she'd seen Loy's handprint on a sidewalk in Greenwich Village. Someone else said he'd visited her grave in Aspen. She's everywhere, said the woman to my right, waving her arms in the air as if Mina Loy herself might at any moment appear. Did I smile or laugh? The waiter set down a plate. Whenever I think of Loy, I said, taking my turn at the silence, I think of that ethereal black and white photograph of her face, eyes closed, hair loose, Light breaks across her shoulder and she turns herself into it ever so slightly. Then the Chinese poet smiled at me and I felt strangely unnerved. I could never be so unselfconscious in a photograph, I said. Die in the past, live in the future, exclaimed the woman to my right. But isn't it ridiculous, I thought. I didn't say this part out loud. The conversation moved on without me. That after all the words of hers I've read, 
the human cylinders revolving in the enervating dusk, all those poems. When I think of Mina Loy, I think of a pretty face. Of course, thinking isn't looking, I went on, no doubt trying to justify my own superficiality, uneasy at having always been somewhat superficial in this way. But while my purest thought of Mina Loy might be an image of her face, that image is itself a kind of thought. It is Mina Loy's face beset by, or in some way accountable to, certain words or ideas, which in turn bring further images with them. Mina Loy's face and the cover of the lost lunar Bedecker, those long thermometer, thermometer earrings, her drawing of a figure shaking sky out of its hair, Joseph Cornell's portrait of Mina Loy, she in a hat, smiling atop a constellation, Mina Loy's face and those star-shaped lamps she made. It's no wonder she is celestial in my mind, ethereal, impossible. In a letter dated July 3rd, 1951, Cornell himself wrote to her to say, I had a beautiful early morning in the backyard under the Chinese quince tree, very early, in fact, not much after five, and I could not help but think of you looking up at the moon when the first rays of the sun turn its gold into silver. I felt sad then, suddenly forlorn, not sure why I'd spoken at all and ridiculously middle-aged. No one had ever written me such a letter or ever would, sitting under a quince tree, sitting at that table with the handsome Chinese poet, thinking about a handprint on a sidewalk in New York. It was not given to each of us to be desired, Loy wrote. I ordered a second glass of wine, a third. Now my problems were upon me, and I quietly seethed while stuffing myself with cracked Moroccan olives. The night was plainly doomed to spiral down. But an hour later, in a brightly lit gallery on Cherokee Street, the poet read his poems in Mandarin. After each, my friend read the English translation, and the poet sat to listen in the empty chair to my left. I felt a kind of intimacy with him then, though we never spoke, only smiled each time he sat, and especially near the end, side by side, listening her to her read a poem in which a man in which a man whose wife has recently died sits alone at a table eating tangerines as inside his bookcase snow begins to fall. On the drive home, snow began to fall. I passed an accident on Magnolia, another at McCree. Cars were sliding off the road. It was in front of one of the old World's Fair mansions on Lindell Boulevard, the one that looks like a French chateau with wings, that under a street lamp I saw her and immortality mildews in the museums of the moon. Fur coat and gloves, snow in her long brown hair. There was no mistaking that face. I almost got into an accident myself, swerving hard to avoid a dog that streaked out from the park. My hands shook on the wheel. I had to pull over. The street was deserted. I blamed the wine, of course, cheapest on the list. I couldn't even bring myself to look in the rear view mirror. I'm driving home, I said out loud, as if to convince myself. So I did, my car at the curb, hurrying up the path. I was stamping my rubber boots on the porch when the moon broke free from the clouds, landing on the fallen snow, the street asleep and alight, the eye-white, skylight, white light district. In the introduction to the lost lunar Bedecker, we're told Loy named her book not for the sun, but for its ghost. Would we call the moon a ghost or this a ghostly light? But I felt better, I did, turning my key in the lock, lucky to be home. Still, I couldn't stop shivering. Even my teeth felt cold. Here was the breakfast table strewn with the morning paper. There was my teacup, I passed through the hall. And yet I was not soothed. Everything felt off, staged. It was like walking through a photograph instead of through a home. And though it was after midnight, I swear I could hear my husband upstairs reading to our son the story about a boy who finds a fallen star and is forced by his teacher to swallow it, then zooms into the sky. I felt a little dizzy on the landing. An ocean of glittering blue-black waves, I heard my husband say, under a huge sky of galaxies. I touched the bedroom door. I stepped into the light. It was my son who was the first to scream, which is how you can be sure this story is mine. 
So that was a little ghost story for October. Um, the last thing I'm gonna read is actually just a couple of pages from um, Sprawl. So when um, Laura first invited me to read, she right away said she wanted me to read um, with Sawako and, um, and she mentioned that, you know, I guess, I think I remember this correctly, that our, both of our work sort of explores um, narrative and humor and the quotidian. Um, and so, and she was talking about sprawl in particular. So I thought I would um, end with sprawl uh, just as a sort of way of bridging into the next reading. Um, so I'm just gonna read a couple of pages from the beginning and then a couple of pages from the end and then we'll be done. Um, so the only thing you really need to know about sprawl, um, well, it's all one big paragraph. Um, so it's, it can be hard to find where I should start reading. So um, actually, Maybe I'll just read the opening page and then I'll just read a couple pages from the end and then we'll be done. So this is the beginning of Sprawl. This place is as large as any other town. Each new day, there is the coming through of sunlight between the oaks. Things fall and because of this, there is a kind of discontinuous innovation. What influences the Richardsons? What influences the Saintsburys? The two questions go hand in hand. How do we cope with the privacy of various domestic characters? The letter, of course, the familiar letter. We employ it. Dear Mrs. Barbeau, it is primarily for the sake of your reorientation to our town that I write to you today. There are more interesting letters, of course. There are no doubt letters with unreserved emotions, just as there are many ways of communicating that are, especially in retrospect, alien to one's own individual experience. It's difficult enough to take in the results, all the sorted aspects, only gauge what's arisen during old Mr. Anderson's lifetime. The changes have imposed themselves on our features. What does it signify? Flowers, birds, churches, plains, resorts, malls, green places, industrial clusters and country houses. Today, I fell asleep in the tall grass near the old train station. It was a complete picture, a fashionable park, yet the picture had its sordid and selfish aspect. I can't seem to say what I mean, Mrs. Barbeau, but with some urgency, I hope to inform you what a triumph the big city has become. I am a secular individual, but even I can feel the shift in the horizon, utterly alien to the constitution of things, the habitual, sincerely, etc. I move in shade on the edge of a parking lot, under walnut trees in the early morning, around the edge of a curb in an accidental manner. I walk the sidewalk and ripple the surface of it. From this condition, I have a view of the, of the world. Magazines provide images of half-cooked food products. Glazed and slick, they seduce us like any raw material. And then I'm gonna flip to the back. Tonight, I deny my ordinary life. I converse with the very words. I impress myself on men's hands as I make my way toward the restrooms at the back. I drop my dress on the floor. I chop produce, I pick weeds. I pop a plastic bag for no real reason. I take advantage of particular events, of particular sentiments to render a particular series of events. I become detached from the routine of lawn, lawn, office building lawn, or bring me milk, bring me sugar. I say, milk me sugar and sugar me milk. I move through the house and let my kimono slip open, a soaring kimono with silvery cranes and blossoms. I get the mail in my open kimono and meet the neighbor's stairs with my own absence. There are bills and catalogs for garden furniture and candles. There is a letter written as a kind of crazy joke. It's a sort of contest, a contest. It's easily stirred. I leave the bowl on the counter and the bugs find it. You're filthy, it says. It amounts to nothing. The season as it progresses becomes uncollective and unplural. I acquire a certain understanding with the abandoned swimming pool in the park. It contains a distinctive temperature, a soft molecular surge. In bed, I can feel it, strange nighttime rhythms. In the morning, a pebble sinks, pebbles and crows. Meanwhile, the evening news is a whole nightmare of the future involving underground laboratories and weather. What is buried in our thoughts is self-evolving. Out there is a continuity of something. It is secretly allowed to cross borders and nations. The book in my hand says, you wouldn't like to live on a coral reef, but sometimes you would. 
I cool my face against the beveled edge of the glass table in the living room. I stand on the table and look out the window. I bruise my leg on the glass edge. So I carry my work into another room where there are decadent lamps and signs of Egyptology as a hobby. Apparently, we are vulgar popularizers of the superficial. Sometimes we don't even know what's happening. Other times I feel it rise up in my throat like a genteel wrath. Haywood's flapping smile is wholly innocent. And what's left? What one might wonder is, is this fast trip through my own little strip of time my own? Am I on it? One day someone will decode intricately wrapped gifts on the far limits of the tabletop. Glass grapes, bunches of plastic marigolds, a blue plate, a white plate, a heaping pile of fallen petals. In the movie of my life, I'll play myself from a distinct path or a gliding distance in the garden, under a stone bench, or from the leaves like a watchtower. It's enjoyable, the rising and falling of large ideas we play off against our bodies, like that thing there. Can I put it in my up or down? There are breakfast plates, a fork, a knife, a chunk of bread, paper napkins, a banana sliced in half and standing on end. Later, on the same table, there's a chocolate bar wrapped in blue and silver foil, a pear. I stand in my house. I collaborate with the window and fill it optimistically with my figure or silhouette, which is somewhat rewarding. Other days, I am ragged and gross. I move into the night and arrive at stones. Then I move southward through an idealized artificial system. I attempt to single-handedly reinvigorate the relationship between people and place. I shake myself on the sidewalk like a dog. I am prominent and astounding, but everyone else is asleep. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you so much, Danielle. That was astonishing. I love your ghost stories so, so much. Um, and also, you know, I'm such a huge fan of Sprawl. We should maybe put that link in the chat again for where to get it. And also, um, I think Wave is doing a discount special for today, 20% um, off. So definitely pick up a copy if you don't already have it. We're now going to take a really quick, like three minute break. So if everyone could come back to their devices at 846, um, we will hear from Sawako so Nakayasu. Okay, see you soon. I have lived basically my whole life haunted by a fairy tale about these three sisters and a witch. The witch likes one of the sisters, so she casts a spell on her that whenever she speaks, diamonds and rubies and other small precious things tumble out of her mouth. The witch dislikes the other two, and so their enchanted speech unleashes toads and anxious snakes. This story of the embodied transformation or translation of words into material, both precious and vile, a backwards Eucharist, always seemed to me to be so alive it was wet, a bubbly nightmare, a memory imagined. I thought of this story again, reading Nakayasu's Some Girls Walk Into the Country They Are From, probably because in one poem, not only peanuts, quote, but also nails, bones, hair clippings, gavels, hammers, and broken tongue talkers will all come shooting out of girl D's mouth and fall down on everyone, on all of us, inside and outside and throughout the train and the rain and the girls and across the dead oceans, training up for the hard rain, for the new weather, for the new weather, end quote. If these poems were my fairy tale, they would be all the sisters, both cursed and saved. They would be the witch, the spells, the bugs, the diamonds, the absent parents, the impossibility of ever being truly prepared for the existence of girls. Nakayasu writes, one girl is a gift, one girl is a city, one girl is a city vanishing into another city, not itself. One girl is sadness, one girl is a well. End quote. And elsewhere, Gull, Gururu, and Girl are pieces of the table swept slowly by the arm and all that remains after all that which glows, end quote. We're back in Meimei's meadow. We're in girl soup. We're taking pictures, breastfeeding in public, fighting inside a bag of Cheetos. Our giant legs fill the street, poised at the end with another surprise. And as seduction often consists of ambiguity, context and brightness, Nakayasu reveals parallels between the mysteries of girls and the mysteries of translation. 
in a Japanese translation which contains its own commentary of Bright Sun and the Head of the Girls, a quote which appeared pages before in English, Nakiyasu writes, it is only ever the mediocre translator, it is only after the mediocre translator gives up on translating that anything of value ever happens, end quote. There's the desire to make yourself understood, the desire to abdicate or evade all understanding, the desire to pick who understands you and when, all present, all impossible, probably. Girl F to girl H of whom, quote, the lines and threads fall into each other and encourage a mutual sparkling until their love, secondary to that of girl F and girl H, heats up into a tiny little sun. They are not up in the head as advertised, but that is how they protect themselves from being discovered and potentially harmed." End quote. I'm truly so grateful for this work and so excited to hear from Sawako now. Hello. Um, thank you so much, Laura, for that beautiful introduction. And thanks for inviting me to read here tonight. Thanks to Danielle for your amazing reading. It was so wonderful to hear you, I think, for the first time. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for, for coming. It's, um, it's fun to see everybody from all over the place. And um, what else can I say? I hope everyone's doing okay. I just have to say that. I hope you're all surviving. Um, so I'm going to start with reading something that's relatively new. It's, it's a little bit of something of a manifesto. Um, and it's called Say Translation is Art. And this is going to be a uh, a pamphlet from Ugly Duckling Press, which is going to be coming out soon. So thanks, Ugly Duckling. Um, okay, say translation is art. And I'm going to drop in in the middle of this. It's just an excerpt I'm reading. Say translating in the dark. Say smuggled translation, illegitimate translation, illegal translation, unauthorized translation, undefinitive translation, unauthorized translation. Screw and unscrew the hegemony cap translation. Say feral translation. Say eros in translation. Say I want to be translated by you. Say but not you. Say I want, I want. I want, I say, say translation oceanic as desire, say wild caged animal longing to be free translation, say I choose, say I choose this, translation a series of choices like any other moment of agency, say choose to luxuriate in the micro erotics of choosing this word over that word, of choosing this word and that word, of breathing heavily into a space that may or may not have been there all along. Say I bend, I love, I stretch, I break, say I bend language translation. I love language translation. I stretch language translation. I break language translation. Say pleasure. Say what is the smallest unit of translation? Say word, say syllable, say phoneme, say orthography, say breath, say the particle of thought preceding the articulation of such things. Say what is the largest unit of translation? Say poem, say book, say all the books, say everything they ever wrote, say everything they never wrote, have yet to write, say the transit between everything they ever wrote and everyone who ever reads anything they ever wrote. Say, what does queer liberation look like if it chooses not gay marriage, but alternative structures of human relationships? Say, instead of translating book into translated book, say, book into translated something else altogether, something else altogether translation. Say that other thing, say ineffable, say possum, say tiger, say intergalactic creatures all afloat in the pre coate digitas, say this is how they translate, say I, you, you, me, I, risk you, me, say witchy, translate me. 
say white feminism grows up and out of itself into the fecund intersection translation. Say to translate the thick river is only one choice out of many. Say to translate while being myself is to write while being myself is to think while being myself is in lively defiance of the social desire to translate like everyone else. Say bad translation, say F translation, say ephemeral translation, say misfit translation, say unpopular translation, say unloved translation, say swerve, say post, say movement, say transit, say conceptual translation, say open text translation, say avant-garde translation, say POMO translation, say POCO translation. Say partial translation, half-ass translation, abandoned translation, mediocre translation, losers and suckers translation, nasty translation, bitchy translation. Say unremarkable translation, say unsellable translation, say unlikable translation. Say vomit, say gagging, say choking translation. Say I spent the entire summer of 2020 with low-grade fever and endless nausea. Say this vomit-inducing country translation. Say I was younger and tried to drink alcohol. Say my body rejecting even a small amount by vomiting. They say women have trouble saying no. I envied my body's clarity in vomit translation. Say race and racism, quiet translation of. Say in Asia, I learned to better understand. Say in 2017, I returned to where I am from and had to learn anew what to say, what not to say, how to say what I had to say, how not to say to the wrong person at the wrong time. Say translating myself into silence, into poetry. Say a book full of translated vomit, gagging, choking. Say in the before of translation is silence. Say in the after of translation is silence, choking only applicable to the latter. Say translation at the edges of perception. Say, do you really want to be defined by your limitations translation? Say aesthetics over politics translation. Say politics over aesthetics translation. Say nation state translation. Say I'm over that nation state translation. Say outsider translation. Say micro translation. Say break and rebuild everything via translation. Say free translation. I say it, I do translate like that and also like this, but there's more to that story translation, more to that arc, art, ball in the air translation. I pitch it to you translation. So that was that. Um, uh, okay, I just want to say thanks and a shout out to to Steen Ahn, who is, who is uh, doing some stuff with me tonight. Well, I don't know why I'm being so secretive. She's going to be writing and drawing um, and drawing. So I am really excited about reading from this book, which is called Some Girls Walk Into the Country They Are From. Um, it's the first time I've had a book come out while I was living in the U.S. All my books are published in the in the U.S., but I've never actually been here. And now that I'm here, we're kind of nowhere, which is maybe fitting. Um, but I want to give a shout out to Wave for being so wonderful and patient with me in the production of this kind of tricky and complex book and say hi to Heidi, who I can see. Um, so so I guess what I just read um, is something I wrote recently, but it also kind of serves as a little bit of a prologue to this book, which is, um, which is a lot of things to me. Um, when we launched it, when it came out into the world on October 6th, I took that opportunity to come out as queer, which was um, kind of uneventful because Twitter's so busy with things anyway. Um, but it was kind of exciting for me nonetheless. And the other, the other aspect of it that I don't really have the right language for is that it's also, um, it's also the first book I've written since I have um, kind of changed my awareness about my own race and ethnicity, which is interesting for that to be something that one changes over life. So, so there are a lot of changes happening that I'm working through in this poem. The biggest or the most tangible change is the fact that I moved back to the US after living in Asia for something like 15 years. So um, let's see, I guess I will start. Um, and I'm 
trying to make a promise to myself to read from this book in order every single poem, which is something I don't normally do. There's a tendency to try to do the greatest hits and read my favorite poems. And I'm, I'm trying to be fair to all the poems because they all have a different place and role in the book. So here we go. Girls rolling themselves. There is a symptom in the proposition when that abundance gangs up. Head cocks to the heat, bending towards both livable and untenable. The exit grows and grows forgetful of its nature as orifice. Hand slackens in relation, a wrestle of train car, company, one day as if any other day or night, send me there off. Something uncanny about these girls, something believing and barely visible. I din in vain, breath too full. Persist, hinder, say too much, as if it were Vegas. Some get the stars shaken off of them. Some are given rose scent. Some are fed animal protein to fatten them up for the flood. When they emerge, they are 10 new girls, A through J. Girls inhabit arch. One girl's lips tremble mountainous. One fears the loss of delicate facts. One slides right off. One leaves a fingerprint in my eye. Here is what I know for sure. One girl is a gift. One girl is a city. One girl is a city visiting another city, not itself. One girl is sadness. One girl is a well. The hat styled with pigeon wings is not a girl. I've told you this before. The girl walking nonchalantly through the streets of a European city is not a girl, unless there is a bat. The girl too full of walks, of women, of sights, comes to pause under the arch. I mix think female all the time. I shook hot your fat into mine. I arch you to the tender touch. That was a burn. I statue my limits into a marble female gaze. That is to say, I am looking at you. You look for a door. We are outside. Oh, we are out. Tem girls in the open room. That old play, one tongue deep in the wound. One breaks off and heads north drifter. One sinks, well, I guess, into the floor. One accepts a fake confirmation that the room is still open. Seven left eventually fading their rights away. All tem pretty okay with none of it pretty taupe. No one said goodbye. Same den bold the corner and observe attempted rescue. Some of the tem penned at the torso, then squat, emerge. The excess of what flows is never silent. One tum dear to my world. Then disband as soon as the room is open. Side loom of the mind. I loll back the missingness for the sake of a roll of grief. Complicated dirt floods my kidney. Those stars, crisp outlines. Stone falls out a wilting body, cusp of absence like some other. Under the condition of sending a warm thing by spoon. 
When asked who wants to ride, sometimes the girls jump up and down. Sometimes they duck, cover, and conceal. In the beginning, it was girl D, girl E, girl G, girl H, girl I, and girl J. The girls who are not yet moms but want that ride have been carting their potential children in a pouch somewhere. When girl J marries a gay man, he repeatedly says, I'm gay. You know I'm gay, right? Girl J says, of course, don't forget all the times I've been cruising with you. And there goes the warm thing. Will you be my spoon forever and ever? Now the bridge, a gray orchid, belonging to girl H, designated at birth, over time evolved from ima sarayanet yara hashi yara hairo no rang toka iware temo kuroi idea of orchid it to image of orchid, to real orchid, described as fitting for girl H, how perfect, how complementary, how beautiful. We do not draw attention to the fact that they have long ceased to mention no naka de ugo meite i ru koi iro no hana ga bu kira to girl H and her gray orchid. In fact, all of this took place so long ago that girl H's understanding of the orchid is limited to the vague yu ko todake wa kakushi sensation of a residual history. At the great bridge, girl H is asked to present her papers. All she toshi has is the gray orchid. They accept it but not without reminding her that she is crossing with a bad orchid. They will be checking on her, te iko. Her foot falters, she crosses. In the distance, a field of daisies waving. Fifi dans un paquet de sheep. Traduit de l'Américain par Genève Shaw. Se bat pour le droit de choisir son chip comme s'il n'y avait que dix chips dans le paquet. Il y a plus de dix chips dans le paquet. Fille A présuppose que plus c'est gros, plus c'est rond, mieux c'est. Fille G croit que les plus belles devraient avoir le droit de choisir en premier. Fils C tente d'avancer la règle de la capacité pulmonaire totale. Fils G voit que les chips en forme de lame pourraient un jour être utiles. Elle reste silencieuse. Fille I refuse. Seul fil H note que tout reste si croustillant que le récipient, je veux dire le sachet, où elle demeure doit être fermé. Seul fil H a un sens de, la, de sa vraie situation dans l'économie globale et la chaîne logistique alimentaire et de comment cela va changer le sort à toutes. Elle a du mal à décider entre parler, gifler ou rester muette. <rire> Okay, girls stealing the air out of my bulmones. Pauled girls and old girls and non-pauled girls and maripona folded girls, all of them show me the upside of t'espoir by arriving at my bulmonary entree with their individual air hags pillowing in my quickening intake, drop um by um into my pannier of herupu is on the way, away, a gut slap tart out of here, instructions gesture towards memory, all balled up and thing-like, fall play to landing on thickets of interior lush lush and quiet tumble rush upwards. A path opening elsewhere, a newer purchase on my little paggy of emergency air, flesh fleshiness of lung matter, thereby under the premise that it can be given back 
Theft flies temporarily so. Dake it, given it back. I bolt out, I open, I close, trying to trap a girl in the fact you make me peel like a natural error. Force of artifice, admonished absorption. Now witness that. Hold, hold it, open again, orbiting again. New definitions of ownership, felt presence of taking it. Don't, don't you dink it now. It's, um, it's kind of wild to read the poem and then look up and see the picture. So thanks, Dean. Um, okay. Girl F or girl I or girl J in a cup, in a battery, in a sheet of paper at a point when it ceases to hold. The business of a hand supports the claims of the trench. Spatial folds of time swell and ripen, broke oft open. Having been overwhelming, sensation of falling over and over across the fold and beyond the rim, exposed to a blunt give. Girl who keeps to the inside of the circular stone of the cup, battery, and sheet. Keep running within or spill out. F, I, or J. It wasn't a girl in the first place, not like that. And what a horrible pit, lie against joy. Paper and batteries in a cup. F and I, don't mind me. Gull, garuru, and girl are pieces of the table swept slowly by the arm and all that remains after all that which glows. Girls respond quickly to a call from high up, translated by Lin Shu. It was summer and we had stopped to see the tool tree on the grounds of the church in Santa Maria. I was 25 at the time and I had 25 daughters, one for every year of my birth. I was carrying all of them, one on top of another, and my mother, too, I was carrying. And one by one, they were climbing into the canopy of the ajuehuete. I, I, I. Society is grotesque and proliferates in broad daylight, but there is time within time and adolescence still waiting. And I'm going to end with this one. Is it safe for girls to have favorite bears? Midsummer night fires in elegant displays of annihilation. From the thick strident part of a curvature, girl G trespasses in the lesser passions. An amange, convincted and growling, originates possible viscosities into a torrent of escape, advances a graceful probing exit. Girl B, on one small ride of light, I know it like the back of my wrist. The woke sunset is a painting. When I look too closely, I am flicked and whistled away by a distant cousin of civility. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sawako. Thank you so much, Steen. Also, those drawings were so, so beautiful. Um, this book is so incredible. I'm so, so excited that it's in the world. And also knowing that you're planning on reading from it poem by poem makes me feel a deep desire to go to all of your readings. Um, great. Well. Thank you, thank you, Sawako. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, everyone, for being here. We're going to turn the chat back on so that um, people can share their enthusiasm there, and we'll also give everyone the ability to unmute themselves. You can say hi that way if you'd like. Um, stay, hang out for a little bit. Thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you to Corey and James for all of their help with event uh, tech stuff tonight. Um, and I hope to see you all at the Poetry Project again very, very soon. Thank you. <laughs>